Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're joined by Professor Mark Malouf our, of our Department of Computer Science. And Professor Malouf has been a member of our community for more than two decades and has played an integral role in shaping our undergraduate courses and our graduate programs in computer science and currently serves as the department's director of undergraduate studies. And Mark, it's so great to have this time to be together with you. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Now you joined our Georgetown community more than 20 years ago. To begin, could you, could, could you share a little bit about your journey? Uh, what brought you here to Georgetown, your, your time here at Georgetown? Give us a sense of your work and the development of our programs in computer science. Thank you, Jack. It's, it's really great to be here with you and, and everyone else in the community. Um, you know, for me, it, it's been a great journey. Uh, you know, when I started in the department, we had, we had five professors. Uh, we had a very small number of students and only a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, over the past 20 years, we've added a Bachelor of Arts. We have a master's program. And, you know, that master's program served as, the, as the, the basis for the doctoral program, which we started, you know, 10 or so years ago. Um, and, you know, as you know, we have a proposal for a new major that's going before the board um, in several days. Uh, that major is computer science, ethics and society, part of the tech and society initiative. And that was a great collaboration with Sue Lawrenson, Meg Jones and Maggie Little. And now in the department, we have around 155 majors. We, we teach hundreds of students from all across the campus in our classes. And about 45% of our, our women are majors, which is a great accomplishment uh, for Georgetown. And you know now we have just this diverse community of undergraduate and graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And it's just you know very different. It's a very different place than, than it was when I started and you know, I, I truly appreciate the support that the university has, has given to the department. So, so thank you, Jack. Well, we're very fortunate to have had you as part of the thank team you. that is responsible for building this department over these last two decades. Now, one of the things that you do is you offer a number of introductory courses for under, our undergraduate students. In addition to what you do at the, with our department's graduate programs, when you offer an introductory course for undergraduates in computer science, what would you say are some of the foundational aspects of a student's learning who is new to the field of computer science? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I, uh, there, there's a quote that I always like to share with my introductory students. And, and the quote is from M.H. Uh, Van Emden. Uh, and this goes back to 1989. Uh, and he said that people who know neither programming nor mathematics take for granted that programming is like mathematics. Yet it turns out that English majors are as likely to be successful at programming as, math as mathematics graduates are. Uh, in practice, the worlds of mathematics and programming are just about disjoint. And you know, I think that is a great quote for a liberal arts institution like Georgetown and you know we have English majors and philosophy majors who take our classes, and I and I think that that suggests that you know it's important for computer science students to realize that they're learning something completely new for the first time in a long time. Students who come to Georgetown, you know, they've taken math courses, they've taken history courses, but by and large, they haven't taken a programming course. And I think that students can get very frustrated uh, because it's not easy. Um, and, you know, we always have to remind them you're learning something completely new. Uh, new students also get intimidate, intimidated by students who've had previous exposure to computer science. And, you know, in a class, sometimes these students can be very verbal uh, and you might feel like you're just, you know, not at the same level as some of the other people in class. And it's really important for us to emphasize to new student that actually new students that the majority of our majors are very successful majors have not studied computer science prior to coming to Georgetown. Um, and, and then in terms of foundation, you know, a good, you know, mathematics is often a good jumping off point uh, for 
new students in computer science, right? You can scaffold from algebra and just teach them how to decide if this pizza from this pizza joint is a better buy than this pizza at another joint. And that can be the basis for an, an algorithm and then a computer program. I might need that algorithm. <laughs> now, you mentioned the new master's degree we'll be, we will be bringing to the board of directors soon. Yes. Now, in, in recent years, we've integrated ethics as a component of learning in some of our computer science coursework, building in lessons and activities designed to help our students engage questions of policy, governance, and technology's impacts on our world. Can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to incorporate this component into your teaching? Yes. Uh, so, you know, in, in any artificial intelligence textbook, especially the one that everyone uses today, you know, there are chapters and sections on the philosophy of artificial intelligence and the ethics of artificial intelligence. Um, and one question is, you know, can machines think? Uh, another question is, is if machines are sentient, you know, what ethical obligations might we have to those machines? But then, you know, as you know, we have machine learning to perform facial recognition on driver's license databases. Um, or you have judges that are using systems to determine whether to release an individual before their trial. Um, and, and I've certainly talked about these issues and talk about these issues in my class, but you know, I'm not a, I'm not a trained ethicist. Uh, and this was one of the great things about the grant that we got from the Mozilla Foundation is it let me and other members of the computer science department work with Mag Maggie Little and some of the eth uh, ethicists in the ethics lab to develop, um, you know, exercises led by professional ethicists in our classes. Uh, you know, and, and in my particular case, in my artificial intelligence class, uh, we developed some exercises and then the ethics lab team came into my class at three uh, times during the semester and took students through um, a guided exercise. And in one of these, uh, we actually asked them to design an AI system uh, for making undergraduate admissions decisions. Uh, it was something that they were all very familiar with. They had gone through that. Uh, we put them into groups. The ethics lab designed these really creative custom uh, worksheets. Uh, they were standing, we were in a room that was a, a whiteboard that was covered in whiteboard material. And so they were standing, they were writing, they were putting up post-it notes. And, 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 and the goal of the exercise was to get them to think about how such a system would work, how it could be fair, um, and you know what might be the consequences of such a system if it were to be making biased decisions. And you know, one student, said, uh, you know, this is cool. I've never seen something like this in a computer science class before. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Now, this semester, you're teaching an introductory course focused on machine learning. Yes. You studied the modern emergence of machine learning and its widespread use in a range of areas, such as pattern and image recognition. For those of us who may use these tools in our day-to-day -day lives, but may not be familiar with how it works, how would you describe the techniques underlying machine learning? Yeah, that's a great question. And, it, and it's difficult to answer because the techniques uh, that underlie machine learning techniques are, are quite varied, quite varied. And, and that's also something that's very fun about this area of study. Um, and you know, in some cases, machine learning really boils down to just fancy counting, Jack. Um, you know, how many times did something happen? Um, how many times did two things occur together? So, for example, you know, how many times did people read these two books or watch these two movies? And you know, from these counts, we can produce probabilities. We can produce correlations. Um, and once you do that, you can use the these models. Uh, for predicting. So for example, if you watch the great British baking show, uh, then, you know, because of these correlations, such a system might make the recommendation, hey, you know, you should watch the chef's table. Uh, but, you know, one of the 
I think one of the great challenges right now is dealing with the complexity of what modern systems learn. Uh, often what they learn consists of, you know, tens of millions of numbers uh, that, that may not really have any semantics behind them like a probability does. And it can be very difficult to understand how such a system, you know, might work in all circumstances. And it, it can be difficult for other scientists to reproduce the same system, even when they have the same training data. And, you know, I think for society, it, it, it's critically important to have discussions about the way that these powerful technologies should and should not be used. And, you know, as you probably know, you know, San Francisco banned the use of facial recognition systems by the police. Right, right. Now, a few years back, you and a faculty colleague in our computer si science department, uh, Clay Shields, were participants in the initiative on technology enhanced learning, what we call ITEL, a series of faculty projects enabled through Candles, our Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship, and our partner, partnership with edX. And, and this work sought to bring the resources of technology into the teaching and learning strategies of our academic community. Now you and Clay's project was entitled Improving Computer Science One. Are there any insights that come to mind for you now as students learn these foundational skills and concepts of computer science in a virtual learning environment? What sorts of insights have you been able to find through your own teaching th this semester? Yeah, you know, Jack, I have to say that uh, the experiences from that project came in handy last <laughs> March. Uh, you know, when, uh, when we all had a week to figure out how we were going to uh, transition to online classes. Uh, you know, for my, Clay, Clay did something a little different than I did. And, you know, I think he's been able to leverage that quite a bit uh, when we were in person and, and certainly now. For my part of the project, I recorded about uh, 80 videos uh, of, of me lecturing on various topics and then I uploaded those to YouTube. And since the project ended, you know, I used those videos to reinforce and supplement my in-person le lectures. Uh, and, and I've continued to do that. You know, if there is a topic that I feel like students need to know about, maybe it's not that critical, maybe I don't want to spend a lot of time in class, then I'll sit down and shoot a video and upload it to um, YouTube or distribute it to the students in some way. Uh, so, you know, Jack, when we shifted to online instruction in March, I had a lot of experiences and equipment that I could use for my online lectures. You know, I actually snuck back into my office and I grabbed, I've got an umbrella light here that we use for that project. Uh -huh. I also think that my lecture style uh, and the way that we teach computer science translates well to online classes. You know, so for example, in the classroom, I, I usually write on the chalkboard and now, you know, I'm writing on an iPad. Uh, I've always done some demonstrations on my computer. That's really easy to do now too. You know, and, and I think one nice thing that I've learned about online instruction is that, is that these context shifts can happen very quickly. So, you know, for example, if I'm, if I'm writing on the chalkboard and I don't want to project something, I have to lower the screen. I have to turn off the lights. I have to wait for the projector to warm up. And you know, now I can just click on share screen and it just happens a lot faster. Um, you know, I, I'm, I desperately wanna get back in the classroom, sure. uh, you know, and so do the students. You know, there just isn't, you know, there's much more interaction in the classroom and maybe that's just because students don't have to unmute. Uh, they don't have to reach up to raise their hand, but you know, and for me, I'm really looking forward to thinking about, you know, what of these new techniques I've been using over the past several months, you know, which of those am I going to try to bring back into the classroom? Or maybe I should just write on my iPad in the classroom. I, I don't know. That's something I'm really looking forward to, uh, to thinking about. I think it's going to be a pretty exciting part of the journey for all of us. What, what have we learned in these last 11 months and what will we be, be bringing forward as we move into the future? Yeah. Mark, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this opportunity to be with you. In, in closing, is there, is there a, a message you'd like to share with our community? 
just looking forward to getting back on the hilltop, Jack. I appreciate that. I do. And again, Mark, thank you for, for all that you do for our community, for all of the work over these last last decades in building our computer science department. We're deeply grateful to you for all your contributions to our community. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya everywhere. <laughs>